apologies. So today I'd like to talk to you about the research that I conducted here in the US uh, through the period of my PhD. Uh, my uh, postdoctoral activities uh, in Madison and Northwestern. Uh, and also, uh, I'll also like to give you some information about uh, what we have been doing uh, here at UTRGV in Texas, in South Texas. Uh, and uh, at the very end, uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, the graduate program uh, opportunities available here at uh, University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Uh, this is just a quick overview uh, of uh, what I'll be talking about. Uh, in the first part, uh, I'll be talking about uh, some of the studies that we conducted during my PhD, uh, which was based on synthesizing some uh, iridium-based uh, cationic complexes uh, and some mechanistic work on uh, the Nazarov cyclization uh, as well. Uh, in the second part, uh, I'll talk to you about uh, an iron uh, bifunctional cat uh, catalyst uh, and some studies we conducted on that area. Uh, in the third part, uh, I'll focus on uh, a tandem catalytic system uh, that was developed, that we developed uh, for cleaving carbon oxygen, uh, aesthetic carbon oxygen bonds. And the last part, uh, I'll quickly give you an overview of some of the research we're conducting down here uh, in the valley, uh, in the Rio Grande Valley. But before I start, I'd like to just quickly give you an idea uh, of my journey through life uh, and uh, just to give you an idea of how uh, the winds of life uh, take us to places where we, we never think about uh, when we start uh, go on this uh, journey of life. Uh, for me, uh, a couple of the main turning points uh, and probably the first turning point in my life was uh, really uh, meeting my high school uh, chemistry teacher, Nigun uh, Hashemipur, uh, in Lefkosha at the Tukmarev College. She was probably the first person who inoculated me with uh, the chemistry virus. Uh, and after that, it was really uh, not a question for me what I wanted to do. Uh, in, uh, in fact, uh, the first year uh, I joined uh, the Eastern Mediterranean University Chemistry Department, that was uh, a hard year for, uh, for, for all involved because uh, it was the year that the chemistry department was, uh, the BS program in the chemistry department was shut down. Uh, and in my second year, I did hear a couple of comments that uh, people were expecting me to also go to a different department uh, as that option was offered. But for me, uh, it really was, like I said, I was uh, inoculated with the virus. And at that point, there was no turning back for me. Uh, another advantage uh, that I would like to point out uh, was, uh, in fact, the minor offered in chemistry and computer science. That really helped me also along uh, this life journey. Uh, it started me uh, start a lifelong journey in learning uh, about using computers and eventually using them uh, in research as well. Uh, apart from chemis uh, chemistry, uh, specifically to inorganic chemistry, uh, one uh, turning point for me was, and my memory with names unfortunately uh, is not that good, uh, as probably a lot of people who know me will tell you. Uh, we had a visiting, va visiting faculty from Hajatepe University uh, in my third year, uh, and uh, she was uh, our inorganic chemistry teacher, uh, pr professor, uh, and that was my first, uh, my first dive into inorganic chemistry. Uh, and at that point for me, really, uh, it became uh, not a question of what I would like to further my studies in, but when and how deep. Uh, and the second turning point for me uh, that really solidified my uh, interest in organic chemistry was in the period I spent in Birkent University. Uh, I was fortunate enough to take uh, an, a graduate level course uh, from uh, Dr. Margarita Kancheva uh, in inorganic chemistry. And at that point, I really uh, started uh, falling in, in deeper and deeper in love with inorganic chemistry. And it kind of was also the reason why uh, I decided to pursue my uh, PhD in the US uh, as uh, most of the work done in Bill Kent University, they were it was top level, uh, was, but was mainly in, uh, at the time at least, uh, was uh, in physical chemistry uh, and analytical environmental chemistry. Uh, in 2002, uh, I moved uh, to the US, specifically to the University of Rochester. 
uh, up here, uh, very, very close to the Canada border, which you'll see is kind of, the borders are kind of my uh, uh, life journey, it seems. Uh, there, uh, I work with uh, Dr. Richard Eisenberg, uh, who, uh, not, who, who uh, kindly accepted me into his group, uh, where we focused on uh, specifically organometallic chemistry uh, and uh, mechanistic work in uh, organometallic chemistry. Uh, after that, uh, together with my wife, we moved to Madison, Wisconsin, to the University of Wisconsin, where uh, under the guidance of uh, Dr. Casey, uh, Charles Casey, uh, we start, we, uh, I continued working on mechanistic uh, studies, uh, learning more about uh, how to uh, more uh, deeply uh, study how reaction mechanisms uh, are flowing uh, and get some uh, more information concerning those. Uh, after about a year uh, at Wisconsin, uh, in Ma at, at Madison, uh, we moved to uh, University of uh, no, no, Northwestern University in Evanston, just north of Chicago. Uh, and there, uh, it was an eye-opening experience because most of the work done uh, in uh, at, at Northwestern is very, very interdisciplinary. Uh, most of the students, the graduate students uh, at Northwestern, uh, in fact, uh, have one or two uh, co-PhD advisors, uh, and uh, most of them are not in chem uh, They have a main uh, uh, advisor in chemistry, and then they have co-advisors in uh, engineering uh, and also in biomedical uh, fields. Uh, and most of the work that, that they're doing, world-class work. Uh, but what I learned from there is that the future is in interdisciplinary studies. It's not really uh, a question of, uh, we, we need to expand uh, our horizons into the multiple areas of expertise uh, and uh, research ideas. Uh, that is really the biggest uh, takeaway from there. Uh, the interdisciplinary nature, nature of all the work done in Northwestern is really what's leading them to be one of the top research universities in the world. Uh, at that point, uh, we were in the job market uh, looking for industrial positions and academic positions. Uh, and uh, in PCAM, in physical chemistry, you might learn the, the, the problem of two body, uh, the, the insolvable problem of a two body problem. Uh, when uh, uh, it's quantum chemistry cannot solve accurately uh, that issue. And we kind of had that problem uh, with my wife. We are both chemists. We're both inorganic organometallic chemists, uh, and we spread our wings as widely as possible looking for jobs. And that led us all the way from the Canadian border all the way down to uh, Evanston, Texas, which as you see here is at the Mexican border. And that kind of uh, is my life journey going from one border to the other uh, in that way, uh, where uh, I started off as a lecturer. Uh, and uh, the biggest takeaway that I would like to give you from there is that learning never ends. Uh, and uh, although my main focus now is uh, teaching, uh, I'm every single day uh, I'm learning something new. Uh, it's, teaching is challenging, it's hard, but it's ultimately really satisfying, at least to me, uh, to be able to help uh, other uh, young minds uh, in their life journey, like a lot of people helped me in my life journey. So in the first part of the talk, I would like to give you some brief uh, information about, about what I conducted uh, in my PhD. Uh, and my PhD was uh, based on synthesizing uh, some uh, cationic uh, electrophilic iridium compounds. And just to give you a, an idea of what I'm talking about, uh, Lewis acid catalysis is uh, an important area uh, uh, of research. It's used in a lot of uh, very important reactions. Uh, the example I'm giving here is a polymerization catalyst uh, that's widely used in industry as well. Uh, that was first of our, uh, developed, developed in Maurice Brookhart's uh, group. Uh, and uh, as we know from uh, uh, Lewis acids, uh, the main idea of Lewis acids is they're cationic uh, and they allow for uh, the, the binding of electron rich uh, the nucleophiles to it, activating them. Uh, and the key point of this category of Lewis acids uh, that causes, that gives them stability and activity uh, is that they have what we call an uncoordinating anion, which uh, takes care of the charge disparity. Uh, 
it being non-coordinating allows for a site very close to the metal center to be available for, uh, for binding of uh, substrates, uh, ultimately activating them. Uh, and this uh, coordination site uh, can then be uh, stabilized by the introduction of what I will call a labile uh, uh, complex, in this case, diethyl ether. Although we never think of diethyl ether uh, as uh, binding to stuff, uh, it's basically ideal in this catalyst in that it binds strongly enough to the palladium center, stabilizing it, uh, but it binds weakly enough that it can be easily displaced by an incoming substrate here, an alkene, uh, which can then be activated by uh, the palladium center and in this specific reaction leading to the formation of a polymer. Of a polymer. So in this category of uh, uh, ca complexes, uh, the non-coordinating counter ions uh, are uh, definitely of importance, uh, and the labile coordinating solvent is also important. And just to point out to you, uh, this is an, uh, one very, very uh, intriguing uh, counter ion, uh, what we call the barf cation counter ion. Uh, it's an ionic in nature. It's very, very bulky. And because of this bulkiness uh, around the boron center, it really does not want to coordinate to the palladium center. And we see this motif continues through these kinds of anions. Uh, they usually are extremely bulky, uh, uh, thus uh, not allowing to, uh, the binding to the metal center, which would effectively uh, deactivate uh, the metal center. So around this time, uh, uh, I, in the Eisenberg group, uh, there was work uh, being conducted on lots of iridium compounds. And the main idea that uh, the driving force of the research was that uh, when, we, when we compare to what was out there, when you look at palladium, it's in the plus two. Uh, when you look at oxidation state of palladium, uh, it has a methyl group with a negative one charge. Thus, the palladium uh, center is a plus two, cation, uh, plus two charged oxidation state. Uh, and most of the, uh, the metal centers uh, uh, out there, these cationic platinum group uh, centers, are all in the plus one and the plus two uh, uh, oxidation state. Iridium, on the other hand, uh, the, the most stable uh, preferred oxidation state of iridium is plus three. So the driving force uh, of the research was that uh, because of this plus three charge on iridium compared to the other platinum group metals, it should be... Uh, uh, it should have a greater level of electrophilicity. Thus, uh, the idea behind it is that it should be more stable, sorry, more reactive uh, than uh, the other uh, platinum group uh, metals. And before I joined uh, the group, uh, work done by uh, both uh, two previous uh, graduate students, uh, Brian Clary and Paul Alberts, led to the, uh, the synthesis of this uh, compl iridium-3 complex, uh, which has uh, on it, uh, this very, very labile uh, diiodobenzene, uh, which again, similar to the diethyl ether group, uh, leaves, uh, uh, stabilizes the iridium center, uh, but th this, at the same time, it's quite labile that can be easily displaced by substrates, uh, allowing for activation and catalysis of, of other reactions. Another key point that I would like to point out is that uh, different from the palladium example shown here, which has one uh, coordination site available to it, the iridium center has two coordination sites. Thus, this can allow for uh, a, a variety of other more complex or more varied reactions to be conducted compared to the other uh, groups out there. And just to give you an example of one reaction uh, that was studied uh, considerably uh, by the uh, by uh, the Eisenberg group in, in conjunction with uh, uh, the group of Allison Frontier, uh, again at the University of Rochester, was the Nazarov cyclization, which uh, in the next slide I'll talk to you about. Uh, I'll give you an idea of what the mechanism of that cyclization is. But uh, this was uh, the first uh, reaction uh, that uh, was studied with, with this new uh, electrophilic uh, iridium catalysts. Uh, and just to give you an idea of what was being done before, uh, copper triflate and other copper salts uh, were being used, were being studied for uh, the cyclization. Uh, and the state of the art at that point was uh, about a two mole percent uh, of copper triflate. Uh, with this specific separate, this uh, divinyl ketone, uh, required uh, heating to about 53 degrees centigrade and uh, about 20 hours to cyclize into this uh, cyclized uh, product with about with a good yield of about 
Now, when you think about organic chemists, uh, chemistry, this is not about, these are not bad conditions. 20 hours is not very, very long. A 92% yield is a decent yield. And 53 degrees uh, centigrade is not that high of a temperature. However, uh, when uh, this reaction, the same reaction was conducted by uh, a postdoc at that time in the Eisenberg group, uh, Messinyanka. Uh, he used the same loading, two more percent, and he was conducting this uh, reaction uh, in an NMR tube. Uh, he added everything, uh, at, and he was studying it in an NMR tube at zero degrees centigrade. And uh, uh, he was able to, while he was studying it, he started warming it up, which takes about probably two, three minutes in the NMR machine. And by the time it warmed up to room temperature, the reaction was basically over. It was completely uh, done. Uh, and the, although I'm talking about two mole percent here, later studies showed that we can go to much, much lower catalyst loading with the iridium complex, and the reaction was, uh, was, was over uh, at room temperature. So compared to the state-of-the-art uh, catalyst used at that time, copper triflate and others, uh, iridium was definitely, this iridium complex was definitely much, much more active. And we, uh, they did publish a couple of more publications showing the substrate scope uh, and other mechanistic details uh, of, uh, of the reaction. And just to give you an idea about uh, what we mean by a mechanism, uh, the Nazar of Substrate Mechanism, uh, uh, what happens is in the first uh, step, uh, the diiodobenzene we saw uh, decoordinates from the iridium center, which opens up two sites for the divinyl ketone to come to bind into the iridium center, which basically now uh, is able to move uh, by arrow pushing. We can easily see that now we have uh, a positive charge at this position uh, of uh, uh, the substrate, which can now then have a, a cyclization occur. Uh, followed by proton uh, deprotonation and reprotonation, moving of this proton down here to the positive, to, to this position uh, at this point, leading to the uh, final product, which can then be, uh, which can then be let go, allowing for the cyclization to continue over and over again. And this is kind of uh, uh, in the later sections of the talk, you will see uh, how we uh, study and try to prove that the mechanism is really in play. Uh, throughout uh, specific reactions. So this is at, at this point is when I started my uh, work in the group, building up on uh, these uh, iridium complexes. And uh, the main project I was working on was trying to derivatize uh, a, a chiral version of this uh, iridium uh, uh, catalyst, with the main idea uh, to see if we can uh, cause enantioselectivity uh, in the Nazar of cyclization to occur. Uh, and uh, the, main, the, the main ligand I uh, chose, there were a couple, but uh, most of my work was on what uh, this, uh, this phosphine uh, BINAP, which has uh, this uh, binaphthyl backbone on it, uh, this bulky binaphthyl backbone on it. And the synthesis was relatively straightforward uh, for with a couple of differences. Uh, it involves uh, starting off with this iridium uh, uh, plus one uh, complex, iridium in the one, uh, plus one oxidation state, adding the bisphosphine to it, uh, and then uh, basically putting the system under vacuum to remove one of the carbonyl ligands, uh, oxidatively adding methyl iodide uh, to the complex, having now two cis iodine positions, uh, which can then be uh, removed using a silver salt uh, uh, to silver iodide precipitates out of the medium, and we, ins uh, we, in we can then in insert uh, a labile uh, coordinating uh, uh, group. In this specific case, instead of diiodobenzene, uh, I, start I started uh, focusing on uh, this uh, diethyl uh, uh, malonate. Uh, as you see, if you, if you, if you remember, the, the Nazarov substrate is very similar but because it only has one uh, uh, double bond, not two, it will not cyclize. However, it binds uh, to the iridium center, stabilizing it enough. Uh, and also, instead of the barf, uh, the, the, the barf uh, salt that we had here, uh, which uh, the main issue with these compounds was that they are very, very oily. Uh, thus, uh, crystallizing them out, purifying them out can be an issue. So what I focused on, instead of using the, the barf uh, uh, counter ion, uh, I focused on another uh, non-binding uh, non counter ion, uh, hexafluoroantimonate, uh, 
which allowed us to grow crystals uh, of uh, of the iridium compounds. Uh, thus, we were able to get uh, X-ray crystal structures uh, proving, uh, showing the uh, the structure of the compounds that we uh, synthesized. And I just wanted to show you this because uh, in organometallic chemistry, uh, one of the biggest uh, tools that we do employ is X-ray crystallography, where we basically, uh, through different processes, we try to grow crystals of uh, the compounds that we synthesize, uh, and then using an X-ray single uh, single X beam uh, X-ray diffractometer, we get the crystal structure. We can think of them as kind of the the photos of the molecules, uh, and in this way we can get uh, bond lengths, bond angles. Uh, and definitely prove uh, what uh, the structure uh, that we have is. And here I'm just showing you two uh, crystal structures that we obtained, one for uh, the diiodo complex here, shown on the left, and one for uh, the active form of the catalyst, or here the resting state form of the catalyst, shown on the left-hand side. Uh, and just to point out to you uh, another use of uh, X-ray crystallography that we would not get with other techniques is, uh, by NMR or other techniques, we would not be able to tell the exact coordination of sites. For example, if you look at this compound here, uh, the methyl uh, meth uh, iodomethane ad addition, we see that the methyl assists to both phosphines, uh, and we know this because of the X-ray structure. And uh, once we add, uh, once we uh, add the malonate onto it, we see that the methyl now is trans to one of the phosphines and cis to the other one. So there's some rearrangement occurring in the structure. And again, we know it because of X-ray crystallography. Uh, we would not be able to tell this stoichiometry, this uh, orientation of, of the ligands just by uh, NMR or other, or we wouldn't be able to tell it simply uh, very, very quickly by using uh, other techniques. X-ray is really uh, an important tool that we use a lot uh, in organometallic, inorganic chemistry. So at this point, we went ahead and did try uh, this compound uh, uh, for a catalysis, an anti-selective catalysis. It was very active. Uh, it did the Nazarov cyclization effectively. However, it failed miserably uh, in uh, an anti-selectivity. The an anti-selectivity that we got was, well, uh, the organic chemists uh, over there will tell you uh, I shouldn't be talking about uh, enantial selectivity because there was no enantial selectivity. We had ze uh, zero EE uh, whatsoever from it. Uh, and when we looked into this system, uh, we kind of uh, it, it kind of makes sense that there is no enantial selectivity uh, in there. Uh, when you look at the chirality uh, in the complex, the chirality is due to this ligand, the, the ligand backbone. And when you look at the ligand backbone, although uh, hopefully from this side we were able to see it slightly, all the chiral information in the ligand backbone is very, very far away from where the cyclization is occurring. Okay, so the 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 influence of uh, of this ligand on whatever is happening on the other side of the catalyst is probably negligible. It's just too far away. Uh, so that is the main thing that we think is happening, that the reaction center is too far away from the chiral ligand, thus it's not able to affect it. Uh, and another thing that we see by NMR is that when we look at the malonates, uh, the divinyl ketones binding to the iridium center, we see that there are two forms, two diastereomers forming. Thus, although there might be uh, an anti-selectivity occurring, uh, because we have two different diastereomers forming at a 50-50 ratio, uh, basically, uh, cyclization uh, might be controlled in one direction, but because uh, of the diastereomers, uh, effectively, there is no, uh, uh, they lead to basically the same product uh, out there. Uh, and at that point, we started focusing on a couple of strict strategies uh, to, to be able to make a symmetric catalysis. One focused on uh, adding more uh, electron withdrawing groups instead of uh, one of the ketones here positions. Uh, this work uh, was continuing after I finished my PhD. Uh, and the other uh, aspect is to make, instead of having uh, uh, this uh, uh, bisphosphines, uh, devising uh, different ligands uh, with C2 symmetry. Which would now basically eliminate these two different binding points. These, uh, if you have a C2 symmetric ligand, these two binding points become uh, the same. You basically have you, you now get away from it in diastereomers. Thus, an anti-selectivity at that point might be uh, applicable. Uh, however, uh, as you might. Uh, 
uh, see from these, these are completely uh, different avenues from what I've been working on uh, and probably would require one or two PhD uh, amount of work uh, to, to be able to finalize. Uh, so at this point, I started focusing on a, a different uh, uh, project. Uh, well, I wasn't focusing on it separate. It was continuing as part of my PhD studies as I work on other stuff. Uh, and the idea uh, to try to synthesize a more, uh, instead of a, a dicationic complex, uh, overall complex, how about if we can uh, somehow uh, introduce a, a third site here that can be removed, thus having a tricationic instead of a dicationic complex. If the dicationic complex is so active, the tricationic one should be even more active. Uh, and the idea that, just to point out, just to give you a, an example of how some ideas are just come from uh, serendipity, just uh, out of a uh, little bit of uh, luck uh, at the situation. Uh, if you remember the starting materials that we had before in the synthesis, there were these, di these diiodo dicarbonyl compounds. And the reason why we started out with these is because my PhD uh, advisor, uh, Dr. Eisenberg, uh, had a very very good relationship with uh, one of the uh, one of the suppliers here, chemical suppliers, uh, Matthew and Sons, and they had supplied him with a huge, a couple of hundred grams of iridium uh, at that point, uh, to and, and we were basically using it over the years, uh, probably over a ten year period without having to buy any new iridium source. However, as I was working on my PhD, we finally ran out of that source, so we needed a new uh, source of iridium. And uh, one uh, uh, one lesson that I learned from my uh, PhD advisor is that uh, price does matter. The price of chemicals does matter. And at that point, we were looking at what kind of starting material we can we can start with. And the cheapest one was the bromo derivative. And that's why now you see here instead of iodo with the with the ligand, you see a bromo derivative at that point. But what that, that led me to think about, uh, and only once I started working with them, uh, we did have also uh, a large bromine bottle in the lab, uh, uh, a liquid bromine. And at that point, it dawned on to me that how about instead of methyl iodide, we just add bromine to oxidatively add bromine to the complex, which uh, leads to us this tribromo uh, uh, complex that we see here. Uh, now, if you compare it to the previous one, where we had diiodo, which, which we can remove by silver, uh, just a silver salt, removal of methyl is by no means easy. It binds to the metal center very, very strongly, uh, and removing uh, a methyl group compared to a halide is a completely different story. Uh, probably uh, it will be easier to decompose the iridium center before effectively finding a way of removing the methyl. On the other hand, when we have the, the tribromo complex, which just to show you here, we get uh, both the FAC and the MER isomers uh, from it uh, in about a 50-50 ratio uh, from the addition of the bro oxidative addition of bromine across, the, of, across this axis, the carbonyl phosphine axis, or across this axis, the bromine uh, phosphine axis. But the tribromide can much, much more easily be removed with, with, with silver. So we can, in fact, we have a, a quick uh, route to go now, not a diacationic, but a tricationic uh, compound. And at this point, what I went ahead, uh, it was coming very, very close to the end of my PhD years. Uh, and uh, after synthesizing these and trying them out, we indeed, uh, when we took this tribromide complex uh, and added uh, three uh, equivalents of silver uh, salts, to remove the bromines as silver bromide, in the presence of uh, Nazarov substrates, we we saw definite proof that it was indeed a much much more active catalyst, and in fact it was capable of cyclizing substrates uh, that the the, the previous dicationic complex was not able to cyclize. So although I'm show, showing it as very very active, there were uh, uh, substrates that basically were too inactive, that even after heating to 60, 70, 80 degrees, no cyclization was observed. But with the tricationic complex, taking the tribromo uh, uh, and adding three equivalents of silver at room temperature, the reaction was over in a, in a matter of one or two hours. Uh, but like I mentioned, at this point, uh, it was a time for me to leave to basically, I was writing up my thesis and defending it. 
uh, and Tulaza uh, Vaidia, uh, a graduate student starting up in the group, uh, who was, uh, she was a, a joint uh, PhD student with uh, Rich and Alison, uh, and she worked, she continued the work. She was able to uh, selectively synthesize and crystallize and characterize the, di uh, the uh, dicatarionic complex and also show that when you take these and you add one more equivalent of silver in the presence of the, uh, the substrates, uh, it is uh, indeed really reactive. In fact, it's probably one of the most uh, active uh, catalysts, uh, electrophilic catalysts out there. And a couple of papers, uh, both from me uh, and after, with me and after me, were published, uh, summing up uh, and, uh, and finalizing this work. However, at this point, I would like to also give you uh, an important lesson in life. Yes, we can synthesize all of these compounds, uh, but in one of my uh, talks, uh, uh, job interviews uh, uh, with with some fa folk, one of the recruiters that was talking with me, and when I presented this work to them. Uh, he had mentioned to me, yes, this might be the most loose, uh, active loose acid in the world, but it will never uh, be used in anything commercial. And the main reason for that is iridium. It's just too expensive. Uh, copper triflate, the one that I showed you initially, uh, although it's not as active, it's cheap. It's much cheaper. So from the perspective of uh, activity, uh, act the most active is not always the best, at least from the perspective of uh, industry. Uh, so that was kind of uh, an interesting uh, lesson that I took uh, to heart, and you'll see later on that it slowly uh, also uh, molded me into the kind of research that we conduct today as well. That uh, finding, uh, just developing catalysts that are not sustainable in the future, that's not, all, that's not okay either. They might be active, but if it's not sustainable, if we won't be able to use them, then this will be a nice thesis, but it will not find wider use uh, in the world uh, or for, for the making of new compounds. At that point, uh, I moved to my first postdoc uh, in Madison, uh, and I would like to just quickly give you an idea of what I worked there. Uh, I started working on a new group of uh, compounds, what we call bifunctional catalysts. Uh, these are, uh, this is a bi what we call a bifunctional hydrogenation catalyst. And the reason why we call them bifunctional is because if you look at the, these two hydrogen positions in all of these compounds, you'll see that one of them bound to the metal center directly is hydritic, it's anionic. And the one bound to uh, uh, this position, whether it's an oxygen or a nitrogen, is, uh, is a proton, it's cationic. Thus, because we have an, uh, a hydritic, uh, an, uh, let's call it an anionic and a protic uh, hydrogen in these catalysts, these catalysts are ideal for uh, uh, hydrogenating uh, selectively polar molecules. Thus, when you take these bi uh, bifunctional catalysts in the, uh, and you take substrates containing both polar groups like this ketone and alkenes, which are nonpolar, these catalysts will basically uh, poly uh, hydrogenate uh, these polar uh, functionalities instead of uh, uh, any other uh, uh, nonpolar moieties. Uh, and in uh, Chuck Casey's group, basically he was working on this, what we call the Knolker compound. Uh, uh, and uh, he was study they were studying uh, the mechanism of uh, the hydrogenation of different uh, uh, polar mo uh, moieties, uh, and when I came in uh, as a postdoc, the, uh, the project that we were working on was the hydrogenation of uh, benzaldehyde, uh, the trying to discern the mechanism of uh, benzaldehyde. Uh, and just to point out to you some of the uh, what we do as mechanistic chemics, chemists, we come up with mechanisms. Uh, the, we, do, we, we try, we don't come up with one mechanism, we come up with multiple mechanisms, and then through mechanistic work, we try to prove or disprove specific points, specific uh, routes, uh, thus uh, leaving uh, the most probable uh, uh, route uh, available to us. So just to show you a couple, uh, one step probably that will always occur is the hydrogenation of the double bond, of the polar bond. What can happen then is we can have a coordination of the alcohol now to the iron center. We can have uh, the, the alcohol, the formed alcohol leave and re-coordinate to the metal center. We can have direct binding of the hydrogen to the iron complex, and then uh, the alcohol group might uh, leave, followed by oxidative addition. 
and as you see, the picture uh, can can come become very very complex. But the whole idea is coming up with as many routes as possible, and then conducting uh, uh, experimental studies to disprove uh, these studies uh, as much as possible, and try to find the the the, the route that is in play. So. Uh, what we did is we basically conducted a couple of experiments. We we did the catalytic study and we found the catalytic rate constant to be about uh, 0 0.4 per second, uh, a turnover rate. Uh, and basically what we need to do now is try to devise experiments where we can, if possible, try to calculate these intermediate rate constants. Uh, and uh, we need to also uh, vary the concentrations of uh, the alcohol, the benzaldehyde, hydrogen, and see if they in any way uh, uh, inhibit or uh, accelerate the reactions uh, that, are, that are occurring. So we conducted a couple of uh, studies uh, to prove and disprove mechanisms, and let me just quickly walk you through these studies. One is what we call stoichiometric reduction, not the catalytic reduction, where we take one equivalent of the catalyst, one equivalent of the uh, substrate benzaldehyde, and, and we try to basically uh, using uh, mechanistic studies, for example, at different temperatures, finding, uh, uh, measuring the rates uh, and finding the rate constant. Uh, we, tr uh, we try to just, we're basically at this point just studying this first step, uh, just uh, uh, the hydrogenation of the alcohol, trying to come up with this rate constant over here. So when we do a stoichiometric study, there is no way for the alcohol to be decoordinated. There is no hydrogen, excess hydrogen to come in. Thus, we're controlling just that single step on its own. And in, in this way, we're able to measure the rate constant for this reaction, which turns out to be 5.5 per second. If you compare that to the catalytic rate, it's much, much faster. So as we know from uh, uh, all the way back to general chemistry, uh, when, we, when we see mechanisms, uh, the, the rate determining step, the step that determines the rate of the catalyst, is the slowest step. So any of these intermediate steps, they, if they are the rate determining steps, they cannot have, they cannot be faster than the catalytic uh, step of the reaction. Thus, by measuring this, uh, thus by seeing how higher it is, 130 times faster than the catalytic rate, we basically are ruling out uh, this step being uh, the, 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 the rate determining step of the catalyst. Uh, we can then take these uh, alcohol complexes, uh, we can synthesize them, uh, and then we can basically add uh, excess hydrogen or different amounts of hydrogen into the medium and now study the next step of the reaction. By, and these, uh, just to point out to you, these are NMR uh, studies. All, the, uh, all these concentrations of the species that you see are obtained by NMR, proton and uh, phosphor, well, in this specific case, proton and NMR. Uh, and basically, when we conduct this step and we calculate uh, the, the observed rate constant, we see that compared to the catalytic one, it's very, very similar. Uh, the, the catalytic one, if you remember, was 0 0.04, and this one 0 0.03, which is, for all intents and purposes, is with an experimental error. Uh, and then by seeing this, we can basically say from this experiment that the rate determining step is, in fact, uh, the, deep, the the alcohol group uh, leaving the iron center and hydrogen oxidatively adding to the metal center. We also conducted uh, uh, some other uh, mechanistic studies. Basically, we tried to see if if we add excess alcohol to the system, will that uh, because when you look at this step. Uh, for hydrogen to bind, if this if this route is being uh, uh, in play, uh, for if the alcohol needs to uh, uh, be removed from the iron before hydrogen can bind in, then any excess alcohol added will slow down this step. Thus, we should see uh, the the, the the rate of the catalyst uh, decrease. And in a similar fashion, if hydrogen is imported in the catalytic rate, any ad added hydrogen. Uh, should uh, uh, cause the reaction rate to, to increase. And that's basically what we are conducting, what we're trying to discern here. Uh, we did the same catalytic studies at, at different concentrations of excess alcohol, and we see indeed that as we increase the, the amount of excess alcohol, the reaction rate went down, indicating that the alcohol is inhibiting the reaction. It is involved 
the, the, the mechanism involved uh, has to uh, have uh, the removal of the alcohol uh, in its uh, occurring before the rate uh, determining step. And in a similar fashion, uh, added hydrogen is causing the rate to be uh, uh, to increase. Uh, the, the rate is faster, again indicating that it is involved in uh, this uh, in the mechanism of the reaction. And this kind of shows you basically how we decide on the mechanism. Uh, we all of the, we devise this mechanism, and then maybe, then basically we plot all the experiments that we did: change in hydrogen concentration, change in free alcohol concentration. Uh, uh, exchange of hydrogen to alcohol and all of those. And uh, we basically uh, look at the different steps. If K1 is limiting, if this is a rate limiting step, then we try to see wh what these experimental results should be. Uh, if K1 was limiting uh, the reaction, uh, hydrogen uh, alcohol exchange should be fast, uh, no effect on added alcohol, no effect on added hydrogen. And we go through these steps uh, based on our studies. And then we find the step, the mechanism that in fact uh, is explained by uh, or fits the experimental data. And it, in fact, it's this step here that really fits all the data. This is our rate limiting step. Uh, this being the rate limiting step tells us that uh, the ox uh, that any added uh, alcohol should inhibit it because we need this free site. Any added hydrogen, because it's in the rate law, should accelerate it, and that is what we observe. Uh, and also, uh, hydrogen alcohol exchange should be inhibited, uh, should become slower uh, at this step, and that is what we observe uh, when we compare the two. So, uh, I know it's a lot of data, but uh, the key takeaway point that I want you to get out of this, uh, when, we talk, when we talk about studying mechanisms, the first step that we always employ, employ, we do not come up with one mechanism. We come up with multiple mechanisms. And then we conduct experiments to disprove the, uh, the, the mechanisms as much as possible, coming up with the most, most likely mechanism. And that is what we mean by mechanistic studies. If you can come up only with one mechanism, that's, uh, always take that as, uh, uh, as an issue. Uh, no matter what you do, try to come up with multiple mechanisms. Never just be uh, one mechanism is not enough, especially when the time comes to publish the material. We need as many po possible mechanisms and show uh, which one is the most probable one. Uh, at this point in my career, uh, it, we needed to do uh, another move to a second postdoc. And the main reason for that is because uh, Chuck Casey was retiring. So I was kind of the last the last person in the group. I was the person shutting down the lights in the group. Uh, and at this point, funding ran out uh, and we we came, we came, were able to conclude the results of the mechanism, but uh, further work needs to be done. And hopefully that will be done in the future. Uh, I do plan to revisit it sometime in the future. Uh, but because of uh, Chuck Casey retiring, uh, it came time to a third move. Uh, and that was a move uh, to Northwestern. Uh, to and I, I'm uh, grateful to Tobin uh, under uh, Tobin Marks uh, under short notice. Uh, he was able to provide me with an opportunity to work with him on a very very intriguing uh, uh, work, uh, which was based on a previous work done by a graduate student Alma Dutza. Uh, she developed a system where she took these uh, vinyl alcohols uh, and she was able to cyclize them. Uh, to obtain these uh, etheric uh, co compounds, where basically, when you think about what's happening, you're basically adding uh, an o the OH bond across this uh, vinyl bond. So the oxygen, you're add you're forming a bond uh, between uh, the, uh, uh, the this carbon over here and the hydrogen is ending up at uh, the end, uh, at the end of it, forming these cycles uh, in that way. Uh, and the key points of this catalyst catalytic system is that it involved uh, ionic uh, liquids. Uh, here you see methyl, uh, ethyl methyl imidazolium triflate. And I just want to point out to you some information about these. These are ionic compounds and they are liquid at room temperature. Okay, because uh, they, they, they do not become solids at room temperature. You need to cool them down much, much further. Uh, thus, they allow for a couple of interesting uh, aspects. Uh, basically, they are, they are very, very good solvents. 
uh, you can reuse them continuously. Uh, their boiling point is basically non-existent. Uh, even if you go to uh, under uh, very, very high vacuum, the vapor pressure is minimal. Thus, you can recycle them continuously. Uh, and they are uh, a category of solvents that are counted as green uh, because of this recyclability uh, uh, associated with them. The other aspect is this Lewis acid that you see here, ytterbium, this uh, lanth uh, uh, rare earth metal, this lanthanide uh, ytterbium triflate, uh, and that's the one key component of the Marx group. They work on lanthanides and actinides quite a bit. Uh, and Alma was able to uh, develop the system for hydroalkoxylation uh, reaction uh, to, to form these uh, uh, these group of uh, alco these group of ethers. Now, when I joined the group, uh, the idea uh, the, or the project that I uh, uh, was uh, working, going to work on was kind of uh, a continuation of this project. Uh, and it was based on uh, a new uh, center that, was, that Tobin was part of, uh, IACT, uh, the International Institute of Atom Efficient Catalysis. Uh, and the, the, the main uh, aspect of that center uh, was that they were working on a biomass. Basically, they were trying to find uh, cat catalytic systems that convert can convert biomass, lignin, cellulose, and others into uh, compounds that we can use as fuels, and also uh, compounds that we can use to make uh, fine chemicals uh, and value-added products. Uh, and the key point that we, uh, the key idea that we came up with, or I should be more open, that Tobin came up with, was: Can we develop a catalyst system that uh, when combined with with the catalysts that we have, uh, do the reverse of this reaction uh, based on microscopic reversibility, and then the formed alkene, can we just get rid of it by possibly hydrogenating it? Okay, so the, the main idea is, uh, if we think about uh, all reactions are reversible, so if we're able to go in the forward direction, even if it goes to 100 percent, there should be the microscopic reversibility principle states that there should be conditions that will allow the reverse reaction to occur, even to a minute uh, level. So now, if the reverse reaction is in fact occurring, if there is even an equilibrium, even a slight, a very, very small equilibrium here, if we can now couple this with a, hydrogen, uh, if, uh, a hydrogenation catalyst, the hydrogenation reaction should have a much lower activation barrier than the hydroalkoxylation barrier. Thus, effectively, uh, if we can find a, a hydrogenation catalyst that's compatible with our system, we should be able to hydro hydrogenate this double bond and basically go to the deep, uh, the cleavage of this carbon-oxygen bond. And the reason why we're interested in this is because when we look at biomass, uh, about 50% of the oxygen content in biomass is locked in uh, aesthetic carbon oxygen bonds. So uh, the, the idea uh, that we were trying to, that I came in with was, can we uh, show a proof of concept uh, that this indeed is possible? So the first part of uh, my work with Tobin was uh, on the second part here, trying to find a hydrogenation catalyst that was indeed uh, uh, favorable, uh, compatible with our system, because it, th this reaction required higher temperatures. We were going to 100 degrees, 200 degrees, uh, 150 degrees uh, centigrade in order to conduct the reaction. Most hydrogenation catalysts decompose at those temperatures. Uh, and, ooh, okay, that slide I did not put in there, so uh, sorry for that. It's, uh, I talked a little bit about it here. Uh, so we did conduct, uh, what do you call it, uh, we we tried to we worked with a lot of both uh, homogeneous and heterogeneous hydrogenation catalysts, trying to find uh, a catalyst system that works. Uh, and most of them, we saw some product, but uh, we never saw completion of the reaction. Uh, up until we started using this uh, palladium uh, catalyst, which was basically uh, it was palladium on supported alumina. Uh, and it was deposited in a special technique called atomic layer deposition. Uh, and this is where I, uh, I mentioned initially, uh, interdisciplinary work is really key in a lot of uh, future work. Uh, this catalyst was developed by another group uh, in, at Northwestern uh, that uh, works on solid state uh, reactions, developing catalysts, uh, uh, heterogeneous catalysts. 
uh, and we were interacting with them. We had the opportunity through uh, seminars uh, in the department to interact with them. Uh, and at that point, we started using their catalyst, and indeed, we saw that it was effective. It indeed was uh, one of the most effective catalysts, hydrogenation catalysts for our reaction. Uh, and we, we then w went ahead and started using it uh, throughout this study. Uh, and we were able to come up, uh, at least come up with, uh, through also DFT calculations uh, conducted by uh, uh, Rajiv uh, Asarai and uh, the Curtis group uh, at Argonne National Lab, uh, we were able to prove or come up with a catalyst system, a mecha mechanism, where basically the ether uh, uh, coordinates to the lanthanide triplet through the oxygen moiety. And at that point, what happens is there is, uh, I should show this as an equilibrium, uh, the oxygen, uh, uh, the oxygen uh, carbon bond here uh, weakens, uh, ultimately leading to the alkene formation. Uh, what we believe is happening also based on DFT is that uh, one reason why it is occurring is that the terbium is also uh, uh, interacting with the uh, alkene moiety forming here, stabilizing it at least slightly, uh, allowing at this point for uh, palladium to also start coming in uh, uh, to, to interact with it and lead to the hydrogenation of that double bond. So this is a tandem system that we believe is occurring. The ether comes in, weakening of the carbon-oxygen bond, then the substrate is uh, bound uh, or taken over by palladium, which then uh, eff effectively does the hydrogenation. We conducted some uh, catalytic studies. Uh, we showed that the hydrogen pressure uh, does not affect uh, the, 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 the reaction, uh, the rate of the reaction. We saw that ytterbium does, indicating to us that it's this first cycle that's rate determining. Uh, and we came up with uh, a rate law based on this first, based on the reaction experimental studies, it's first order in uh, lanthanide, it's first order in substrate, and it's zero order in palladium and zero order also in hydrogen, uh, hydrogen uh, pressure. We conducted uh, a wide variety uh, of substrates uh, against the proof of concept uh, study. Uh, and just to give you an idea of what we used, uh, this, uh, the scales that we used down here, but we showed that, and as you see here, the temperatures are really, really high. We need to go to almost 200 degrees centigrade, a temperature not possible without ionic liquids. Uh, and the turnovers that we had uh, were modest. Uh, the biggest thing that we observed is that uh, linear, uh, linear alcohol uh, ethers uh, had a, we were able to cleave the bond at lower temperatures and a much higher uh, uh, turnover rate. Uh, and this led to a couple of publications uh, at that point. But again, it comes to a point, uh, it shows you that uh, the, how uh, both interdisciplinary studies are important without uh, the, oh boy, I, the Peter Stairs group. Uh, I mentioned that I was bad with names. Peter Stairs group who developed uh, this palladium catalyst, this work would not have been uh, done we would not have been able to uh, as effectively cleave uh, this carbon-oxygen bond uh, at all. Uh, the expertise was not uh, in the Marx group. We did not have that expertise to be able to continue that work. At this point, uh, it was 2012. Uh, I, have, I have been working with Tobin for three years at that point. Uh, and it came time to now, well, find a, a permanent job. Uh, and that is when we, both me and to, uh, my wife, uh, Tulay, uh, were, th we were thankful that we were able to find uh, a position in the same city to begin with, uh, let alone the same uh, institution. Uh, uh, here, uh, I've been mainly focusing with uh, teaching, uh, but part of the teaching has involved research with undergraduates, mainly for me, undergraduate students and a couple of master students. Uh, and developing a research program that uh, is compatible uh, with what's happening uh, with the level uh, of resources available and the students uh, led us to focus on DFT, uh, computational chemistry and DFT, which was a, a couple of skills that we uh, were developing we had through our uh, years here. And the reaction that we were focusing on was cleaving carbon-carbon bonds. This is a topic that uh, Tulay was working also in her PhD years. Uh, and uh, basically what we were trying to do is develop 
uh, catalytic systems, mechanistic studies to analyze uh, the, the a hard problem, to tell you the truth, the cleavage of carbon-carbon bonds and thus activating them and producing new work. And just to give you an idea of why this is a hard problem, uh, the main hard, the main problem is that uh, in order to cleave a carbon-carbon bond, for the metal to be able to interact with them, it needs either uh, uh, its orbitals to align with the bonding or bonding sigma orbitals of uh, the carbon carbon bond to weaken it and it also needs to its uh, d orbitals to overlap with the anti bonding sigma orbitals of the carbon carbon bond again to to weaken them now because of uh, the small size of these uh, or metal orbitals and also because of the size uh, of the carbon atoms it's much much it's kinetically uh, what we call these uh, these bonds kinetically inaccessible not they are not easily activated by the metal center. In contracts, for example, there are lots of systems that activate carbon hydrogen bonds. The mechanism is about the same. We have the same kind of orbitals interacting, but because the hydrogen uh, is small, because there is no other atoms uh, on the hydrogen side, uh, the the interaction of the metal orbitals with these uh, carbon hydrogen bonds is much much easier, and hence cleaving carbon hydrogen bonds is much much easier than. Uh, uh, carbon hydrogen bonds. Nevertheless, uh, some work uh, has been conducted, some systems have been developed, and there's lots of uh, literature out there uh, defining it, uh, what happens. Uh, but one such substrate, which is also of industrial uh, importance, for example, in the uh, DuPont uh, process, the process that's used for nylon synthesis, uh, involves uh, 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 aryl nitriles where you have the CM bond bound to an aryl group. Uh, and here you see the first example of an earth abundant metal, nickel. Uh, nickel is widely, uh, is getting more and more used nowadays because it's more abundant uh, and it's cheaper. Uh, well, that's uh, from a sustainable perspective is uh, a better option. Uh, and basically what has been shown that nickel is int intriguing in that it's capable to bind to these carbon nitrogen bonds and it's capable of breaking specifically this carbon uh, uh, aryl bond here, the CC bond found here. Okay, there is the advantage also in this process that there are no hydrogens uh, around here, so there is no carbon hydrogen bond to compete with the reaction. So we're kind of uh, inclined to to form this bond uh, out there. Uh, and just to show you a couple of possibilities with alkyl nitriles, uh, uh, this work was done in the Jones Group at Rochester. With alkyl nitriles, it was shown that this we need uh, light, uh, shining light uh, to, to cause this reaction to occur. With aryl nitrites, on the other hand, uh, uh, we needed to thermally activate the bond. And in fact, it was shown that there is an equilibrium between this eta-2 complex and the oxidative added complex. So at this point, what uh, we started doing is uh, we started focusing on these uh, the computational studies of these compounds. Uh, compounds and trying to come up with uh, uh, some work that can be done by students uh, in the short period of time that they are with us. Uh, and DFT was uh, an ideal work, uh, uh, ideal tool for us. And again, just to show you an a couple of examples of why these uh, the CN uh, uh, aryl nitriles are important with these nickel compounds. Uh, they are used in natural, uh, they have been shown to be uh, very, very imp uh, efficient in the production of uh, lots of uh, natural products, uh, whether they still incorporate the cyano, uh, the CM bond, or whether it's a leaving group that leaves uh, forming these cyclic bonds, and also in high EEs as well. So there is a lot of uh, importance for activating this carbon-carbon bond of nitriles in there. The work that we did with our students, and this is work that's about to be published, uh, uh, hopefully soon, uh, is uh, taking these uh, fluorinated uh, benzonitriles uh, and uh, working out, uh, trying to get some thermodynamic uh, properties uh, out of them. So basically, uh, what happens is if you take this uh, uh, benzonitrile complexes, they bind to the nitrile group. And then you'll see shortly through mechanistic studies, we showed exactly what's going on, uh, uh, ending up with the oxidative addition product. We know that it's an equilibrium 
And again, we studied these with, which we tried to show the mechanism through DFT uh, as well. The focus of this last couple of slides is going to be this fluorinated benzonitriles. Uh, we have what we call uh, uh, the ortho position, the meta position, the para position, and also the difluoro, uh, uh, the, the two, uh, two five and, and three four position uh, uh, fluorinated compounds. And we try to compare them to see uh, what kind of results we can get out of them. Uh, just to show you uh, another, a couple of uh, x-rays. When doing DFT, uh, we need experimental uh, work. Just doing DFT on its own is not enough. We need uh, experimental results to prove our uh, DFT work. Uh, and these are just some crystal structures that we used uh, uh, as starting points for our DFT work. This is work done by a postdoc, Sebastian uh, Lakashize, uh, uh, back in the day. Uh, and he grew these uh, uh, crystals, and which we then went ahead and took and started working on them through through computational chemistry. Uh, there's a lot of uh, also uh, just to show you from the X-ray stru structures, we get uh, accurate, very very accurate bond lengths and bond angles, stuff that we would not be able to get uh, out of just NMR. And just to show you also another aspect of inorganic chemistry, uh, different from organic chemistry. Uh, phosphorus NMR, fluorine NMR are really very, very important for us, especially when we do kinetic uh, and mechanistic work. Uh, the phosphorus NMR, the fluorine NMR are relatively clean. We only have a phosphine group here, one fluorine. As compared to proton NMR, we can get much, much cleaner data, much, much cleaner integrations and better uh, kinetic data out of them. And we use fluorine and phosphorus quite a bit. Uh, some more experimental data to show you. We were able to grow crystals of all the uh, structures, the ortho, the meta, the para fluoro, both the eta-2 coordinated and the oxidative added products, and also the bifluoro, uh, the 2-4 two, uh, the two four and the 3-5 uh, 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 difluoro substrates as well. And we used all of these as our starting points for the DFT work. And just a couple of more experimental results to show to you. Uh, by conducting these uh, reactions at different temperatures, both and different solvents as well, THF and toluene here, we're able to get thermodynamic data, delta H, delta S, and delta G of the reactions. So that is important as well, important information to corroborate uh, uh, the DFT work that, uh, that, that we conducted. And this shows you how good I am with PowerPoint. Uh, I forgot to remove the animations on the slide, but this is the Van, this our Van Hoff plot uh, on the left-hand side, and these are the data that we got, the thermodynamic parameters that we got out of the Van Hoff plots out there. And just to quickly give you an idea uh, of what we can do with DFT, uh, just to show you, uh, give you some information about the program Gaussian 16 that we use, the level of theory uh, that we use out there. Uh, through NMR, through experimental data, there is no way for us to see transition states, intermediates uh, uh, at all. We cannot detect them. They are tra transient species. Uh, but through DFT, uh, we are able to see that uh, the process involves uh, the nitrile. When you look at the nitrile and try to go directly from the nitrile to the oxidative addition product, we see that, that at least according to DFT, that does not occur. What we see, in fact, is that the mechanism involves initially migration of uh, the nickel center from the nitrile group to this double bond here, what we call the two, three, uh, the one, two position over here, uh, forming an intermediate. And only then, uh, from this intermediate, do we have oxidative addition cleavage of the carbon carbon bond. Okay, I will not show it today. But what we, we also did some MBO analysis to show the, uh, the how the orbitals of the metal centers interact at these different states. And indeed, it seems based on those MBO analyses that the metal center just cannot interact with this carbon-carbon bond to oxidative, sorry, this carbon-carbon bond to oxidatively added at this stage, just too far with it. The geometry of the phenyl ring is not appropriate for, for that interaction. And only when we get to this one, two position, uh, are we able to, in fact, cause a nickel to interact with this carbon-carbon bond effectively, causing it to cleave. Another thing that without DFT we would not be able to see, uh, one question you might ask, since we came to this double bond, what about the other double bonds? This just what we call ring hopping, can it be not possible? And based on DFT, we saw that. 
we saw that in fact uh, the the nickel center does uh, we have very very low uh, activation barriers uh, and in fact the nickel uh, center does go along the string uh, reversibly throughout uh, ultimately uh, uh, settling down at this uh, one two position uh, and then from there going to the final product we were able to study and this is work that we were uh, we conducted with undergraduates uh, just to introduce them to DFT, and I think it's over yep, in these two slides. We just basically gave them one of these steps. Uh, we introduced them to how to do the calculations, and we had them just study these individual steps on their own. Uh, and they were able to, through methodic uh, uh, studies, what we call uh, uh, scan, IRC scans, they were able to come up with a transition state uh, connecting these individual points. Uh, we were also uh, gave them this uh, this work to just rotate this phenyl group, trying to find the lowest energy conformer uh, of the ground state structures. Uh, and this these uh, work were directly done not by the math graduate students, not by us, but directly done by undergrads, uh, just to give them an idea uh, of what research is, uh, and also uh, uh, how to uh, effectively present the results uh, to us to 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 other people. Coming back to the work, one interesting uh, aspect that came up uh, is that it turns out that uh, the ortho position is really the most important. Uh, the orthofloro position it has an intriguing uh, result on uh, the equilibrium constant on the delta G of the reaction. It turns out that compared to just benzonitrile, which does not have any fluorines, if we have one orthofluorine, we see that it becomes more stable. Delta G becomes more negative. And when we add a second uh, uh, fluorine to the ortho position, the delta G becomes even more. It stabilizes the compound, the product, much, much uh, uh, more effectively. Compared to the meta positions, we see that there's also a slight meta effect, but really the ortho, what we call the, what we're terming now, the ortho effect is much, much more paramount in these reactions. Having an ortho group is affecting the, uh, the delta G, the, the reaction enthalpy quite a bit. And now we're trying to uh, finalize these results uh, with DFT. Uh, with with orbital analysis and trying to uh, come up with an explanation exactly what's going on. Is it an electronic effect? Uh, is it more of a, a steric effect? Uh, and we're trying to conclusively come up with that result. And there you go. Again, I forgot to remove the, uh, the animations on the slide. And before I go to that last slide, or how should I do this? Yep. Uh, let, let me finish off this talk and then I'll talk to you a little bit about our graduate program, uh, just because it does sum up uh, a, little, a lot of my journey. Uh, there are lots of people that I, that are, I have not mentioned here. Uh, all my uh, in, uh, lecturers, my instructors, my professors uh, over the years, uh, students and what have you, but there are a couple of people that I would specifically like to name. Uh, in my journey at uh, Eastern Mediterranean University, uh, two people who really uh, took me under their wings initially uh, and started me on this journey were uh, uh, Hamid Jenner, uh, Dr. Jenner and Dr. Hasipolo, uh, who uh, Hamid Abi and Hatice Abla, which some of you might uh, have also interacted with uh, and know about. They really initially took me under their wings and kind of looked, well, uh, brought me in to research uh, and brought me in a way uh, into the master's program, uh, which at that point Dr. Garib uh, took over uh, and he uh, kindly guided me over the years uh, in analytical chemistry uh, and uh, mentored me uh, through my master's degree. Uh, at Bill Kent University, uh, I already talked about uh, Dr. Kancheva and I should have mentioned her here. Uh, that's a mistake on my part. But one person who really uh, made me grow as a human being there is Dr. Talal Shahwan, uh, who, uh, to, again, there he took me under his wing, uh, both experimentally. There we worked together on uh, an environmental project uh, nuclear, uh, with uh, Dr. Hassan Ertan uh, together with him. Uh, and he kind of uh, led the way for me uh, there. Uh, but after uh, two years there, I finally decided that uh, environmental chemistry is not the route that I want to go in. And at that point, I came to the States, to Rochester University uh, in New York State, uh, and worked with uh, Rich, as we call him, Dr. Eisenberg, uh, and uh, Dr. Jones, 
uh, who was my wife's uh, PhD advisor, he, we interacted, these two groups, the Eisenberg and Joan groups, interacted a lot. We were next to each other uh, and we used the same facilities and both, uh, both socially and professionally, we interacted a lot. My postdoc advisors definitely helped me grow up uh, uh, a lot uh, as uh, uh, both a human being and as a researcher. And my years down here, both uh, in our legacy institute, UTPA, and our current uh, institute, UTRGV, there are many, many new, numerous students, both in my classes and in the lab who work with me. And also, uh, without uh, the Advanced Computing Center at uh, UT Austin, all, none of this work would have been possible. This is, uh, just to give you an idea, if you Google it and you look at it, it's uh, at least at the time, about a year ago, that's the last data that I have. It was the most, it's the strongest computer cluster available for academic research in the world. Uh, and uh, through the UT system, uh, this cluster is open to us at UTRGV. Uh, to to work on uh, without having to pay money. Uh, it's just a small application, a small uh, grant proposal that we submit, and they are kind enough to give us a lot of data, a lot of, uh, they allow us to use it. And like I said, without them, this work definitely would not have been possible. But before I end and give the microphone back to you, for all you students out there, I just want to give you a little bit of information about our department. And these links uh, I did send out to uh, Professor Sakalla uh, Izetoja. Uh, I'm sure that he would be more than uh, happy to uh, give you the links uh, to these, but if you Google them, you'll also be able to see them as well. Uh, our department is, uh, we have currently a master's program. And just to give you an ex uh, what, what UTRGV is, uh, you might have heard me, UTPA and then UTRGV. UTPA was closed down in, UT in 2013 uh, and reopened as UTRGV, sorry, in 2015. And the reason for that is uh, because they wanted to, uh, there is a couple of, uh, political uh, funds, uh, re research funds at the UT system that were not open to us as UTPA. Uh, and they, the only way that they became open to us is by opening a new university. And although we have right now uh, a master's program, the idea of becoming a new university was to get those funds to grow the research uh, at UTRGV, eventually becoming what we call an R1 Institute and opening a PhD program. That's still a bit in the future, uh, but that is the whole idea. That is, if you think, if you think of what's, what the heck is going on with these people closing down and opening universities, uh, it's, poly, it's a bureaucracy, uh, and it was, but it was, it was mainly uh, with the aim of basically having PhD programs throughout the university uh, uh, as well, increasing research uh, that is being conducted here. Uh, we currently do have a master's program. Uh, open to us, uh, and we do have, uh, uh, if I recall the dates, and uh, Izet Hoja would be able to give you those dates as well. Uh, I believe for the fall semester, the deadline to for applying is June. Uh, there is an application process, uh, and in one of these links, in fact, you get to the uh, graduate college chemistry program. It talks to you about the admission requirements. Uh, a couple of points for international students. The university does require you to take the TOEFL exam. There is another exam also. I don't know if it's available in Cyprus. Uh, I, I, I recall from my days at least that the TOEFL exam was available. They do also require the general SAT, uh, the SAT general test as well. Uh, but just to point out to you at UTRGV, they, they just require you to take the SAT test. They do not require a minimum score from the SAT test. Uh, I just want to point out that to you. The process of applying to UTRGV uh, is a two-fold process. You first have to apply to the graduate college. They do their due diligence and accept you to UTRGV. So, uh, sorry, they give uh, their acceptance first of all. They then send your application to the department where the graduate committee uh, then meets and decides on accepting you to the program. So it is a two-pronged program. Uh, a step. Uh, so uh, if you would like to come here uh, planning ahead to take the exams required, again, just look at these admission requirements. They're all down here with the application deadlines. 
so it might take a while to take the TOEFL exam, the SAT, so it does require a little bit of planning uh, ahead to, to be able to accomplish all of these. The department does offer TAs, TA shifts, teaching assistantships. Uh, we do have a couple of professors here uh, that do have grants. They do offer research assistantships as well. And you're hearing our cat. Uh, our cat does not like the doors closed. And now he's ha said he has had enough. He wants to come in, but hopefully he'll be able to stay quiet for a little longer. Uh, we also have scholarships available through the department and the college to graduate students. For example, right now, uh, there is a sustain sustainability scholarship that's being offered, which is offered to 10 graduate students. Uh, and we have a couple of uh, uh, students applying it from the graduate students from the master's program applying to it. Uh, to give you an idea of uh, living expenses here, uh, the valley, the Rio Grande Valley, is compared to other parts of the U.S., it's much cheaper. The climate, if you like the climate of Cyprus, you'll like the climate down here. It's almost exactly the same uh, the, here. Uh, an example I would give, it's exactly, Mesabiya it, Havasa is the term that I would use uh, for us. Uh, it's hot uh, and humid. You will definitely see snow maybe once in every five years. Uh, the temperature right now, uh, throughout winter, uh, I only had a raincoat on me, and I went uh, throughout winter. I had just short sleeves here. Uh, it's definitely the climate is nice, uh, uh, and uh, like I said, uh, uh, it's relatively cheap to live down here in the valley. Uh, the TA uh, assistantship that you would get would be enough for uh, everyday expenses uh, uh, that you would have. Uh, and the scholarships, uh, and if you can get a research uh, scholarship as well from the department, those definitely are pluses as well. Uh, so definitely living with what you would gain here uh, uh, is possible. Uh, uh, with, that, with that respect, you'd be able to pay any tuition that would, would be required and you'd be able to live off the, the money that you would get uh, from, from it as well. Uh, you can get also some more information about the department, uh, the faculty, uh, what kind of research they conduct. Uh, there's a lot of new faculty that have come in. But for you who are also interested in biochemistry, there is a second program here uh, at uh, UTRGV, the Biochemistry and Molecular Biology Master's Program, which is a joint program between chemistry and biology. Uh, it has courses both in chemistry and biology, and it's geared, uh, well, as it mentions, for, for that degree. Uh, it's a new program. It's been up and running for the last two years now. Uh, and if you are into that field, that is definitely another program that you might be also interested in applying. Uh, I've heard a lot of wonderful stuff about it, and there are a couple of faculty in chemistry. Uh, Dr. Zhang, uh, Dr. Dr. Ahmed and a couple of others who are also part of this program. But with that, I would like to thank all of you. Uh, hopefully I did not run too much over time. Uh, one thing that you would notice from uh, a faculty once we start talking quite a bit, we like to talk a lot. Uh, but hopefully the information was useful uh, and it gave you an idea about my journey. Uh, over the last, wow, 20 years uh, since I left Cyprus, uh, and hopefully it was useful. But I would like to thank you finally for, for your patience, for your time, and I also like you to thank the university, the college, the department for the opportunity you gave me to, to be here. Many okay. okay. Many thanks to Dr. Atishi for his speech. Now for time for questions. We have time for questions to Dr. Atishi. Thanks a lot. It was very, very <laughs>
<laughs> so it's my honor to listen to you really. It was a, a perfect presentation. I congratulate and uh, wish you further successes in your career. What I would like to ask one uh, here, I couldn't read uh, uh, from my place. The mechanism of your cyclization product was ionic or uh, radicalic? I couldn't catch it from my place. It was, uh, it was ionic, so if I go back to that slide. Uh, it's ionic. To that specific slide, yes, it's, it's ionic. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I want to ask uh, here up, uh, about the cyclization product, the um, cation, chiral cation. So uh, what was the uh, yield of the product? Ooh, so the final product? Yeah, the, the so yield of the product for the cyclization product, the uh, yeah. chiral uh, the, um, cation. So, okay, so uh, the yield of the product itself, the chiral reactions I conducted was high. It was uh, 95 to 100%. However, the enantiomeric uh, excess was non existent. It was basically 50 50 uh, uh, enantiomers. Yes, 50 So it means that it was, uh, okay, 50 50 percentage. No selectivity? No selectivity. Yeah, okay. Okay, so then it at least it was um, the um, um, different stereoisomers. So did you try to use it, for example, it's cationic in the um, interaction with DNA? Did you think to uh, make an application like that because you know that DNA is negatively charged and then maybe it may you can success some kind of the binding. Maybe you did. I don't know. Yeah, we we never went with uh, uh, any biological systems. Uh, and in fact, uh, I forget his name, uh, but there is uh, a professor at uh, UC Davis, California, in San Diego, uh, where he used uh, RNA molecules, protein, as ligands to bind to these kind of these kind of complexes. So uh, I would I would I would be surprised if I wouldn't be surprised if they do bind to to DNA molecules. Uh, and in fact, when you think about uh, Oh boy, uh, cisplatin, uh, it's, it, it does bind to DNA through a similar mechanism uh, in that way. However, we never looked into any applications of these iridium complexes, these uh, Lewis acids uh, with any biological system. But I would, uh, I would, I would think that it would indeed uh, be able to bind. One question I would have would be con concerning uh, stability, uh, because once uh, the 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 binding malonate leaves uh, uh, these two sites become available for binding and if we don't have anything that binds to the iridium standard strong enough long enough until it reaches the dna molecule then uh, it is very very likely that it can decompose that would be one drawback about it uh, is because for activity we do need these kind of substrates uh, and if i go back to the malonate here we need this kind of substrate which binds strong enough to it to stabilize the iridium center. Otherwise, uh, it can decompose very, very easily because of the octahedral structure. Uh, it does not like to, to, to have any other geometry. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, in the catalysis, uh, once we conduct the catalysis, once we run out of substrate, uh, we do see that the iridium, without anything to bind at these points, does uh, decompose. So as long as there's something to bind at those positions, it's stable. But if there is nothing to bind, then it will decompose very, very rapidly. It's decomposed at around 100 degrees? Uh, so in my studies, yes, 100 degrees was, was too high. Uh, so uh, when we were doing, uh, one, one thing that we did try with uh, the what we call unreactive substrates, uh, we went, if I remember correctly, it was a while back ago, 
uh, but they did go up to, they used toluene for those reactions, not methylene chloride. Uh, and in toluene, they did go up to uh, reflux in toluene, uh, but they saw no reactivity with them, and they saw the composition at that point of the, of the catalyst. So thermally speaking, uh, probably the upper limit uh, would be uh, in the 80s for this, for this uh, category of compounds. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Thanks a lot. Come Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Atishin. Uh, we have already extended our program. So at this stage, I would like to say really, really thank. And let's clap once more, Dr. Atishin. <laughs> if, someone, if someone has further questions, uh, just we can Google his name. Automatically, we can find his contact number in uh, Grande Valley, uh, Texas University. So I am sure that he will be happy to answer your future questions. I Thank would be more than. And say a very great greetings to uh, Dr. Tulayatish as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you.